Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you. Thanks for answering the question. If you did just sign in, um, it'd be great for you to put in the chat box your name, where you are, and how you identify racially, just so I know who's here and who I'm talking to. Um, great. So uh, Dan shared a little bit about me and my background. Um, I now facilitate with people who are going to work with the people. So I don't do direct service. I'm not working with young people as much anymore, but that is my background. Um, and surprisingly, I am super interested in HR now. My 20-year-old snowboarding sailing instructor self would be shocked that I'm interested in HR, but I'm like really see the potential for it to be the place for an organization to live its values. Um, I think HR just needs a rebrand. It's actually like a place of potential like revolution, really. So um, I'm psyched to be here with you. Thanks for joining us. Um, some of the folks that I collaborate with are on this slide here. Um, it's also who I'm in, um, in accountable relationships with as a white person doing equity work. Um, these are all Seattle-based folks, and so I try to be really upfront and aware of um, being a white person doing equity work. And um, so these are some of the people that I am in accountable with. Great, I'm just reading some more of your... Um, responses. So uh, the uh, one thing I like to do whenever I start working with folks is to name, um, we're on native land here. I'm in Seattle. We're on the Duwamish land. Uh, there's many, many tribes here that are um, active and um, doing lots of different organizing. The Duwamish are still not federally recognized, and that means a lot of things for their funding. Uh, so it's great to check in about whose native land are you on, um, where you work, uh, where you do your outdoor um, programming and uh, also Duwamish or um, native line of where you grew up. It's just really useful to know and name and um, part of the way the oppression works is that they stay invisibilized. Um, so let's see. Right now, as we wait for a few more folks, um, I'm curious, what's your most pressing HR need and how is your organization living equity? Um, do you think in those terms? Do you talk about it like that? I'd be curious to hear what's your most pressing HR need and how is your organization living equity? Um, so I'll just give a pause for a moment for folks to be able to, to share um, in the chat there. What's your most pressing HR need and how is your organization living equity? And while you think about that and maybe put some answers in, um, here's what I want to ground our time in. Uh, curiosity, if you're curious about yourself, your own biases, um, curious about your organization, and then really being in connection. So grounding and being connected to yourself. Um, we're going to create a little small community here um, connected to your community back at work. Um, and then really bringing it back to the larger community that you are a part of outdoor ed and outdoor field. Um, so I'm making some working assumptions that your organization really values equity and diversity um, and that you want to improve your current hiring and retaining practices and that you personally want to grow around equity and diversity. Um, so these are the working assumptions I'm making about you and who's here and um, about your organization that you're working for. So Oh good, someone, let me read this for a second. I'm not good at talking and reading at the same time. Increasing staff diversity is um, to represent the clients we serve. That's a pressing HR need. Great, thank you. Your biggest goal is hiring qualified staff that better represent your students, more veterans and people of color. Great, thank you. Um, wanting to reach out to recruit more staff of color and make sure your organization is actively working to remove bias. That's great. Really good stuff. Thanks, everybody. Oops. So, um, sometimes when I do a lot of this work, we spend some time in, in vocabulary, because when we're talking about this stuff, there's, there's a lot of different terms, and some of them mean different things to different people, and I really do want to ground us in the difference between equity and equality, because they sometimes get used interchangeably, and today we're really going to focus in on what are these three boxes on the right-hand side under e equity. What will it mean? what we need to do differently that might look like those three boxes, so more, what more will you need to do to get the results you want? And so just to, um, this visual I think is a really good one. There's that other one with the baseball diamond and it's a little problematic for lots of reasons, but um, this one's really useful to think about what, will, what kind of effort, resources, time, or energy will we need to spend to get the results we want. Um, so one of the most important things I've, 
figured out for myself is that all of this needs to be grounded in relationships. Um, I think most of you have mentioned things like recruiting and retaining folks of color, um, especially if your organization is predominantly white or a white culture. And um, there's lots of tips and tricks. The thing about that though is that um, if it was just about implementing you know, five, these, these five tips or reading this latest article, we all would have done it by now. So um, what I'm clear on is that because oppression divides us, then logically the antidote is connection. And that starts with relationships. Um, so I'm really gonna ground a lot of this strategy in, in relationship building. Great, welcome Maggie. Okay, Indigenous Heritage, thank you. So I'm curious, um, and this is, a, I'm just gonna throw this out there kind of question, you can answer it if you want, but to really think about how, um, what does racial justice and racial equity look like at your organization, or what do you want it to look like? And are you using these terms explicitly around racial justice and racial equity? Clearly lots of different types of equity are really important. I feel like um, it's not, it can't, it won't happen passively. We can't just like hope that the right candidates will come to us. We have to actively try to attract them. Um, and usually that means we need to, you know, the staff, the board, your PR materials need to explicitly use the words racial justice and racial equity. Um, and so a lot of times that'll mean getting comfortable using those words, having a lot of conversations about why racial justice, why racial equity, um, and shouldn't we just say we want um, equity for everybody? Uh, so I just encourage you to, if you haven't already, really start to dive in and get comfortable and encouraging and making the case for explicitly hiring or explicitly using the terms racial justice and racial equity. So here, just to start you off with a lot of um, uh, really great resources and organizations that are doing this already really well. Um, there's a bunch of organizations. I did highlight a bunch of them here in Seattle because I know them really well. Uh, and then on the right-hand side are resources, articles, and podcasts. And then once you start clicking on some of these, when you get the, the slide deck afterwards, there's just so many more resources to send you to. So I did like a high level, kind of my favorites here. Um, and so you're probably familiar with a lot of these great organizations and, and podcasts. So um, here's an HR equity toolkit. I'm just gonna pause here for a minute to let folks um, really check this out. It's not a lot of it's like rocket science or brand new information, but what I did was is I interviewed with my colleague, um, Kiana Jackson, who together we do HR and equity consulting. We went around and interviewed a bunch of organizations and asked how are you living equity your, and your values, and specifically, how are you doing that through your HR policies and procedures? And we looked at these six buckets here, and we're gonna focus on recruiting and retaining, um, which are really job posting and hiring is around recruiting, and then the performance eval and promotion retention are around retaining. Um, and then you'll get this in the slide deck when you, after the, afterwards. Um, some of these are really tactical. They're really easy. Just implement it and do it. Uh, the, the first two job posting are very, very tactical strategy based. And the other ones, performance eval and promotion retention, they're more adaptive challenges. That's culture. And so those are more long-term work. It's like an individual needs to have an aha moment to really wrap their minds around this stuff. So I'm going to go through some of these things today. Um, and feel free to put out questions if you need me to slow down or anything like that. Okay. So um, recruiting, again, there are some real technical challenges here that we can just implement and do easily. Um, that said, if you don't need to make the case, like if you, are, you have positional authority to do the hiring and make these decisions, that's one thing. If you are needed to make the case to um, your higher up or your board, um, then that takes a little bit more work to make the case. So again, my working assumptions are that, that you're here and you're already ready to do this. Uh, okay, so Savannah Tomlinson has this really great quote in her yearbook that anything is possible when you sound Caucasian on the phone. Um, that's just real. And we just get to notice what that means. Um, so a lot of um, opportunities to really be intentional about your language and or in your marketing materials and in your media. And there's a delicate balance between um, having better representation of who is possibly in your program or who you're serving, and then also not tokenizing. Um, so that's a really kind of like delicate balance, and um, you just get to try things. And all of this, I tell all my clients that 
this is a pilot. You're going to try something. You're going to, you're going to try a new way to do a hire and then see how it goes and assess afterwards. Um, this isn't a fundraising strategy that you're just going to like roll out and do from A to Z. Uh, a lot of this work around equity is um, it's new. The world is a very different place than it was a year and a half ago, politically and socially. And so um, there's a lot of unknowns. So I encourage you to like think of everything you're doing moving forward as a pilot, and then you're going to test it out and see what happens. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the job posting and the application part. Um, so recruiting and hiring. You know, it was often, so often I hear things like, well, we just couldn't find qualified candidates. And, um, and this is a place of opportunity to really look at what do we mean by qualified and where are we looking to find them. So here's four very actionable things to do, and you maybe are already doing them, um, but really to look at your expectations around baseline skills. What are you requiring? What's actually really required versus preferred? And what can you train for? Um, so reducing the technical requirements for, for incoming staff without sacrificing on safety. Acknowledging that we're requiring certain technical skills or certifications, we're limiting our pool of privileged to privileged applicants who can afford to get to do those certifications. Um, and providing scholarships for things like woofers or doing them in-house. Um, all of this is about doing things differently. And so we can just call equity work, um, social justice work, change management, because basically we're saying the status quo has worked for some, doesn't work for everyone, so we're going to need to do things differently. Uh, so all of these are things about ways to do things different to get the results you want. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, so... I think a big piece about this is to value different experiences and skill sets. Um, we have such a limited kind of um, idea about what makes someone qualified, what they're bringing to the table. Um, and I think this piece around what people have to offer, um, you know, if equity or think, knowing about different um, identity groups and to better meet your students' needs is a value. Uh, how, how are you hiring for that? Is it in there? And, and people who are already hired, are they being brought up to speed on it? Um, so really looking at um, who you're, who you're, who, what kind of skill sets you're valuing. Um, one key organization I've worked with, they really shifted away from hiring outdoor people to hiring youth workers. Um, I, uh, most people, I didn't ask this question explicitly, but I know a lot of folks are serving young people. You might be serving veterans as well. Um, but to look for folks who are more focused on like outdoor, on, on youth experiences, youth work, as opposed to just outdoor ed. Um, and then supplementing with a specialist to, to complement um, someone who's more youth work focused. Um, so places to post. So that was a little bit like on your job description and now we're gonna shift to places to post. So, um, you know, I think that there's this, this thing about relationships and recruitment it can't be passive. It just has to be a really active, um, active like seeking out of trying to get talent and posting or reaching out or making connections to places that you haven't already. Um, so college groups, identity groups like POC groups or social work, um, education, psychology majors, things like that, um, you know, a lot of nonprofit groups have great listservs that are identity based. Um, my colleague who I work with, Kiana Jackson, she is a part of like several Facebook groups that are POC only groups. So I can't post there, but she can. And I think that that is where our networks and our relationships are really, really key. Um, and not in a, oh, I, I need someone to fill the box kind of way, but to really investing in the long term of building relationships and with different communities. Um, so I think the other piece too is really um, who doing like doing an assessment, who do you not, who you're not connected to, like personally me, Fleur Larson, who am I not connected to? And what do I need to do to expand my own personal uh, networks there? So I've said this already a little bit, but this is just so um, really, really key that if you want different results, you're going to need to do different actions. Um, and so we get to look at our relationship to change. We get to look at, you know, most of the time, a lot of people will say, but this is how we've always done it. Um, and 
also people tend to want proof that it's going to work. And again, that this is a pilot. We don't actually totally know and we're going to try something and we're going to assess when we're done and see how it goes. Um, but really grounding in what will I need to do differently that equals those extra three boxes of um, usually it's time, money and resource to get different results. So a little bit about retention. Um, this is really, you know, around culture and adaptive challenges. Um, a lot of times we're looking at, is this culture white? Is it a really white culture? And that doesn't necessarily have to do with how many people, how many white people there are. Um, but this thing about like what kind of inclusive environment we're creating uh, and who feels welcome is a really, really big, important question to ask. And we get to start with our norms and culture. So just things we take for granted um, and think, things like our communication, uh, what, what's considered polite, our relationships, our values, really just getting um, very honest about what, what are the norms and culture of your organization? Does the fish know it's what type of question? And um, how would you describe your organization's culture and how might an outsider describe it? Uh, and really, this is a place to have a really generative conversation internally. So again, here's some specific kind of questions to ask. What are your communication styles? How is success defined? Um, a big one here in the Pacific Northwest, I'm from Seattle, so there's a whole Seattle freeze, Seattle niceness, passive aggressive communication norms here that are they're really a thing. And um, just really naming that, being honest about, you know, what's one cultural norm of your organization, whether it's healthy or unhealthy, um, but just getting really honest about, are we aware of how we are? Um, so community agreements, I know all of us um, probably do some type of full value contract or community agreements or um, group covenant or whatever. And what I feel like is really important with these, that these are active steps to creating an inclusive community. And I'm not gonna go through them all right now, but I do wanna highlight a few that just, I know I'm always learning and unlearning about, um, and that's my normal might not be your normal, number five, and that's really, really key. And, um, and then also number six, intent versus impact. Sometimes I'll see that um, written as assume best intentions, but that lacks accountability. And people can have great intentions, but then there's still an impact, usually a negative impact. And we have to be um, accountable for our impact, whether that means apologizing, cleaning up a mess, um, unpacking something, or really like looking at what is, what is making amends look like. So I want to pause um, and actually ask folks, um, which one of these is your personal stretch? Which one of these is hard for you to do um, that you are wanting to live into? And which one do you feel like is an org organizational stretch that your organization um, needs to work on? Uh, great. Thanks, folks, for sharing your, your answers here. So um, again, this is an opportunity for us to like slow down and do some, some work internally. Um, and these are all, they're not rocket science, but they're really hard to do, staying engaged, right? Like just, um, it, these are, we, they take recommitting to. Huge expectation of assimilation. Got it. Yeah. Um, so I encourage people to do this with your own staff and the board. Um, really having vertical um, awareness about who are we as individuals bringing, what are we bringing into the space, and who are we collectively. This is really, really a useful exercise to do. Great. Thanks, Devin, for answering. Yeah, we have some ideas of normal. I don't know about you guys, but I, um, my dad was an Eagle Scout and he's a captain in Alaska. And I grew up with the motto that if you want anything done right, you do it yourself. I've had to really unlearn that. That doesn't really support collaboration. Uh, it definitely it, uh, lines up with internalized racial superiority of feeling like I'm right, as white folks are groomed to feel. Great, thanks everybody for chiming in here. Yeah, sp share, speaking for yourself and sharing your experience. Um, it can be really powerful and authentic useful to be vulnerable and, and authentic. Um, that is what helps create a safe space and um, will want, make people want to, 
to be there. Great. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So um, when we think about, so right now we're like looking at, we're moving into more culture stuff here. When we think about who's here and who's not here, and maybe some things about why we get to look at this through power and privilege. And um, on the lower left here is the author of this work. Her name's Leticia Nieto. Her book is Beyond Inclusion, Beyond Empowerment. It's a phenomenal body of work. She's actually also here local, um, and I've gone to several of her trainings, and it's just, it's really transformative work. Um, so you maybe have seen this information. Um, and on the left-hand side is a social category, knowing there's many more. Uh, this is a, a simplized, simplified version. In the middle is agent rank, and that's who has power, who's, who has privilege, who's socialized to have privilege. Um, and I will also say that you know, this is grounded in the current U.S. climate. Uh, and then on the left hand is the target, who's targeted by that oppression. So I'll run through it just to show you. I'm an adult. I'm able-bodied, although when I was a young person, I was diagnosed as dyslexic, so that's an example of a hidden disability. Um, I was raised Protestant, although I didn't really know that. It's not like I had Protestant pride coming out everywhere, but all my holidays were always celebrated, and everywhere I went, um, uh, in my workplace or school, were my holidays represented. I am white. Um, I grew up working class, so in the target rank there, but I um, have class privilege now and have a master's degree uh, and have a trust that I um, have as a safety net. So my, uh, my background is as a working class person, but I currently have class privilege now. I'm straight. Uh, I'm not native. I was born in the U.S. And um, I'm in the target rank because I'm female. So this would be a useful thing to do for yourself, to do with your staff, to just name where's, how, you know, who's, whose identities are here through the context of power and privilege. Um, and just bringing some awareness to... Uh, the privileges that each of us walk through the world with. And the way that this stuff works is that I feel like each of those agent rank targets, um, agent, sorry, agent rank statuses are like blinders where we're socialized to not know about the other group. And that's how it stays in place. Um, so to ground into really like, who am I? Who's our organization? And who's here and who's not here? Thank you, Brene Brown. Tons of amazing work here around the difference between fitting in and belonging. And when we talk about retaining folks, we're really looking at, are we asking them to fit into our culture? Um, or are we, are we creating a, a culture of belonging? And a culture of belonging is really a co-creation. Fitting in is like, hey, come join us. It kind of makes me think of inclusion. Hey, we'll, we'll, we will include you into our world. Um, and there's so many of the cultural norms of outdoor ed that um, are really, really exclusive. And so kind of getting clear on this difference between fitting in versus belonging. And belonging really asks us to, to change, to shift. Oh, there's a new person here, or a new identity, or a new interest, or whatever, and, and co-create um, a culture that's going to work for everybody. And often in a longer workshop, especially in person workshops, I'll ask people to look at, um, think about a time when you felt like a real sense of belonging. And what were those ingredients present? What, what created that sense of belonging for you? And um, kind of getting clear on your own moments of having that so that you can think about creating that in your workplace. And this goes to how this work is just really, it's everyone benefits when we do this kind of work. Um, because everyone wants to have a sense of belonging. It's really central, right? So um, around that, around performance evaluations, again, this is a, um, a, a kind of a, an adaptive challenge in thinking about whose measures of success are we really looking at um, when we think about communication styles, how someone demonstrates um, if they're competent. Um, we see that change around gender norms. Um, and who is you know, wanting attention, who's asking questions. And I think the biggest thing with performance evaluation is really in investigating how are you measuring success? What does it mean to be a competent instructor? Um, and are you measuring for um, 
ability to understand equity? Are you measuring, because you know, some organizations say if you don't measure it, it doesn't exist. So is um, social justice or equity or cultural competency, whatever words you're using, uh, are those qualities or skills in your performance evaluation of your instructors? And especially for folks who were hired maybe before a time your organization was valuing this, how are you gonna bring them up to speed? And again, this is some change, um, culture change work, asking people to adapt. So I think it's really important to make sure we're, we're looking at what, um, what are you measuring? And then how are you um, accommodating folks for if they need, they need different support. And this is one area where I think about the boxes and if we're really gonna think about the difference between equity and equality, equality is everyone gets the same amount of professional development money. Uh, but we get to be in the question about is that what's really useful? Will that really move us forward? And might doing different amounts of professional development money for folks who have been historically marginalized or excluded from the outdoor ed world actually support us in getting the results. We want to have higher qualified um, staff of color to help us meet our mission. So that's one example of really looking at how we're doing things, not in, in based in the definition of equality, but really getting clear on, the, on grounding into equity and how more boxes, what will that mean? And I think that affirmative action is kind of like me, this is really confusing. Um, people have had bad experiences. There's, it's a lot to tease apart. And so um, really kind of exploring some possibilities that might be a little bit bold and scary. And again, housing it as a pilot. We're gonna try it this way and we're gonna see how it goes. Um, are, we, are we giving everyone the same professional development money even though everyone has not historically had access to these um, you know, support services? Um, and then the other thing that, you know, um, in terms of professionalism, what's considered professional, we go to a lot of cultural norms. Um, a lot of things that come up here in Seattle are things about timeliness, a relationship to time, and um, kind of some white cultural norms around time. And you know, it's it's not a throw the baby out with the bathwater, but just to get um, have an honest conversation about what do we consider professional, uh, and does that line up with our values of equity? And so, kind of going line by line and really evaluating this. Um, and, and just some things that we feel like are a given. So the my normal might not be your normal is just really a big one here with performance evaluations, right? So again, we get to look at who's set up for success. What are they measured against? Um, how often is it tied to compensation? And what kind of support is, is offered? Um, what kind of support are you really offering folks so you don't, so sorry, I'll go back to someone's question is how do you measure for this? Well, and one thing I just look at, because some of this is subjective, it's like how this information sits in their mind is I ask people, are you aware of your biases? Because we all have them. Um, what's your definition of equity or how do you live equity as a human being? And how do you see it playing out in your professional life? And, um, and then also, how do you think we can better meet our students? Or how do we, how do we deliver our mission grounded in equity and, and that person who you're evaluating, sharing what, what they think about that? Because um, so much of this is really about an individual's relationship to their own understanding of their biases and then their relationship to equity work, um, which usually means that you know, you need to have some good definitions. Do you have an equity statement? Does your organization have values tied to it? Um, let's see, Maggie said, I'm not sure if we're using the right tool to measure, um, assess racial justice. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that anyone's figured out the end all be all tool. Um, it really is about just starting and just doing something and trying it and figuring it out. Um, great, thanks for you guys for answering. So having this be really explicit, so for whoever is delivering the performance eval, um, it's best if you also have done some of your own personal work around this too. Um, I think for me, and again, I'll just house this in Seattle with so much passive aggressive communication, 
most liberal white folks here consider themselves really good people. And there's this really un, un, not useful dynamic where I'm a good person, therefore I'm not a bad person and only bad people are racist. Um, and what's true is none of us escaped this bad information about how to treat people. Um, we all got taught really um, different information and by people we loved, our teachers, our parents, who set us up to have some um, information that's really not accurate about the rest of the humans on the planet. And so kind of really digging in and being honest about your biases and do you know them? Do you know your blind spots? That way you can manage for them. And this is why this is tied into performance evaluation is how do you, you manage? What kind of training do folks need? Um, what kind of support? This is just like any other skill set. Um, so really having it be in your performance evaluations in a major way um, and just try things. It's verbal feedback. Yeah, so have it be written because then you don't have any of the he, should, he said, she said types of things. Um, great. Okay, so um, a pipeline, promotion retention. Um, I think this big piece, one thing that makes me think of a lot is if we have um, interns and, um, you know, really um, having an equity, equity assessment of your current positions, titles, responsibilities, what are people being paid, um, what kind of pathway for advancement are you offering folks, um, and looking at your overall organization's culture of growth. Um, there were definitely some amazing outdoor jobs I had, but there was really nowhere for me to go with them. Uh, and so retaining talent, um, you need to keep, what are you doing to keep people there? So, you know, we talked earlier about attracting folks, but what are you doing to keep people? Um, and that looks really different for lots of different outdoor ed um, organizations. So promotion and retention, um, how are you promoting people um, based on what, um, and how are you really thinking about providing a pipeline for folks that have been historically marginalized or not given access, um, which goes back to my normal might not be your normal. And so again, what does qualified mean? What does professional mean or look like? The big piece with this is who can afford to do this work? Who can afford to get the skills and the training and the gear? Um, who can afford to take a low paying job? And, um, you know, I look at like AmeriCorps, who can afford to do AmeriCorps? It's, you know, you're literally living on pennies. Um, being an intern, so paying your interns, that is a way to live equity, paying your interns, um, really actually having a competitive compensation. Um, yes, feel free to, someone asked if they can run a job description um, send it my way. Sure, be happy to look at it. Um, I think this other piece too about the kind of lifestyle that we um, lead in outdoor education. Um, it's very individual, like I'm just gonna go off and do this thing, I'm gonna go away. And if folks are coming from communities where they're more connected to their family or they have to care for their family members, um, even just support around logistical stuff around housing and transportation. It's just, those are ways to support different folks having access. Um, and again, here this says, include equity in your performance evaluation. So who, who set up for success from the jump, right? And then how do we get to do things differently? Um, and really looking at who can afford to do this work. Um, so again, talking about an advancement pipeline, um, I would just really comb through and look over your, title, your job titles and responsibilities um, and compensation for this. Um, so this one, when you, if, to retain folks of color, really thinking about mentorship and sponsorship and how they're different. Um, people need to see role mem members, they need to see themselves reflected just like for you know, your, your students, your clients. Um, and same thing with your own staff. So how are you caring for your staff people? Um, so here's a list of like the difference between mentorship and sponsorship and being really um, uh, clear and upfront and not just have it be informal. Um, you know, if someone doesn't feel comfortable reaching out to someone, um, asking for that kind of support, how can you, if you're in a position of leadership here, how can you offer this or set this up? I'm curious, is anyone here doing um, targeted mentorship and sponsorship for your current staff of color? 
Okay, I'm not seeing any answers, so maybe no one is. Is that true? I don't want to assume. Nope. Thanks, Maggie. <laughs> okay, so what would this look like? What would it look like to, you have a fellowship program for POC candidates? Cool, sponsorship. Got it. Thanks, Devin. Um, yeah, so what would it take to set up some type of mentorship and sponsorship in your organization? Um, yeah, so someone, Maggie asked, what's the difference between fellowship and internship? And people set these up all different ways. So I, I'm not sure that I can give a blanket answer. Um, I, some of it's your funding source. Some of it's like the duration or the conditions or the agreement. Um, either way, um, my question is always is who are, how are the people getting into the internship or fellowship and what's compensation look like? So that's what's important to me about an internship or a fellowship. Like, where are these folks coming from? How are you getting them? Is it just a pipeline of your same type of folks? And or what's the compensation? Um, and experience is not adequate. Experience is not enough, right? Um, I'm looking at some of your answers here. A nice function of our board members is to offer mentorship to staff who have shared identity or experience. That's great. Um, good. Uh, I mean, Eliza, I mean within your own organization. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you have other sites, you could think about it that way too. So, um, exit interviews. Who does an exit interview? Who does exit interviews with your people? Who does exit interviews? And does anyone do a stay interview? What would it take to keep you here before someone's out the door? What do you need so we can keep you? This goes back to retention. And then with the exit interview, hopefully you've created a culture where people can be honest, right? So that's another question. What's the quality of the information you're getting? Are people sharing with you the real reason they're leaving? As opposed to when we meet up with our friends for happy hour and they're like, well, here's why I really left. Um, so do you have a culture uh, where people can share authentic authentically and vulnerably? And then what do you do with that information? Does it just get filed away and live on a shelf somewhere? But what do you do with that information? Um, does it really actually inform your future uh, positions? So yeah, so the difference between exit and stay interviews are really the stay is what can we do to keep you? So sometimes that's asked in a performance evaluation. Um, you know, it could be what would make this job even better for you. And um, an exit interviews being, you know, tell us about your experience working here, why you're leaving. And um, this again, I mean, I know when I was an instructor, I just, I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't be bothered with this stuff um, on the instructor side because I just wanted to go and do my next thing. And so really having this be just a really important part of, um, of your HR process. Again, I feel like HR needs a rebrand because it actually could be amazing, um, but it's kind of been a little bit of a... Well, my relationship to HR previously was just the person that told me no or rules about how to do things. And so really looking at the humanness in human resources. Um, and I'll leave more time. There'll be time for questions here at the end too. So um, a lot of what we talked about will take more time, more money, more resources. And again, that's, those are the boxes of, of how we can get the results we want, some different results. More time on your end if you're doing the if you're doing the hiring for recruitment and building relationships and tapping into networks you haven't yet potentially more money if you're gonna offer training if you're gonna offer um, you know paying interns if you previously haven't um, and then just resources internally right and again thinking of, of things as we're gonna try something and figure it out we're gonna we're gonna try it differently with this one hire and see how it goes so thinking of things in terms of a pilot really lets everyone, um, gives everyone the grace to learn and manages expectations. Um, and I think it's really important to be upfront that this will take more, more time, more money, more resources than what we've previously done. 
um, especially if your organization is in any type of scarcity, uh, where funding is, is a threat, or we're trying to like skimp on, on paying people, or um, that really to live our values. This is actually when we're aiming ourselves at equity means that um, everyone will benefit because we'll have to really invest internally, invest in our people in a way that we hadn't before. So um, I'll pause there and um, really just open it up to see what, what questions do people have now? Um, what would you want more um, specific information on? Um, was there anything I went over that I went over too fast that you want me to review for a minute? So what are your, what are your questions now that um, you want to be sure to ask? And um, I'll try to answer them as best I can. Um, what did I not touch on that is really important to you that would be useful to have um, me speak to and then maybe folks from other people are doing a lot of amazing work already. So what are your, what are your questions right now at this point? Great. So le legal stuff. Um, yeah, super important. Um, well, one thing, um, this will, this will partly answer your question, Dan. One thing I think a lot about actually, and I didn't mention this under job posting, but um, especially if you're working with vulnerable populations and you require a background check, um, it's really, really useful to get, uh, get some, in, be in the question and look at what does it mean to pass a background check? So there are like egregious, the egregious list of, of like no-nos, right? Like things where you're like, that's clearly not gonna pass. But then there's usually a huge range of gray about what does it mean to pass a background check, and um, we, if we, you know, if we know that black and brown folks are racially profiled by the police in this country more than white folks, then they're more likely to have a record. Um, you want to look at how your your organization's relationship to background checks, and so much of this is about safety, and and you know we always want to be super super safe. But how in our quest to be safe and responsible, are we already um, limiting our candidate pool from the jump by putting background checks on the job posting? So I'm not saying don't do that, but I am saying really be thoughtful about what does it mean to pass? What does it mean to pass a background check? Um, for some organizations, we suggested they don't put it on their job description, try that, and then if someone advances in the hiring process, you'll say, so you're going to work with young people, we will need to do a background check, here's how we, you know, we think about passing. If anything pops up, we look at how long ago was it, what, was, what were the conditions, um, and then what have you done since then to kind of um, ameliorate that. Uh, and so you get to be in contact with your insurance. Um, this is a good one to be really clear with your, your executive director or your, your CEO about this. Um, too often what passing a background check is left up to the individual hiring person and there's a lot of bias in that. So at least have something written down about how do you determine if someone passes a background check. Okay, so now I'm gonna read some more of your questions. Um, Let's see. Okay, so what does racial justice or equity look like at your organization? It's a question I asked, and someone is looking to know what are the benchmarks. Um, and when I look at even just, I'll look at your PR materials, and do you, do you, what are your, does your website reflect that? And we know that often, you know, if it's just PR materials and whatever's on your website, that might not really translate to what's lived. Um, but if I'm just from the outside, I would want to look at, well, do they have an equity statement? Do they, um, are they naming words like equity, racial justice? Um, and that would be one way to internally for it to then be public on your website or in your PR materials. Um, that said, it needs to be authentic. It can't just be lip service. Uh, and so the, the other thing is, um, you know, I do work with a lot of mostly white organizations here in Seattle, and just be honest about that. You know, we are majority white, and we're doing a lot of work to um, unlearn our bias and, um, and create a really welcoming environment. And so instead of trying to cover up anything, just, be, just name it and own it. And um, here's what accountability looks like to us. Um, 
that has just been more, it's more useful to be, um, be honest about where you struggle. And that's not a popular thing to do because we all want to look like we got it all together. Okay, I'm going to look at someone else's question here. How do we offer specific programs for POC folks, i.e. internships, professional development funds, without making them feel separate less or less qualified? Yeah, so um, that's a good one. So I'm a white person, so I can only speak from my experience doing that. Um, and my colleagues of color, um, you know, they're able to speak from having their own lived experience around that. Uh, and I think that it's delicate. A lot of this has to do with whoever is doing this. If it's you that's offering these specific programs, um, if I'm uncomfortable or nervous or I'm unsure about this, that will translate. If, if I'm really worried that I'm making them feel separate, then I'm probably going to come off as feeling like they're going to feel like there's something funny going on. So a lot of this goes back to the individual and their relationship to doing racial justice work. Um, so I guess that's my first thing is if you're the one that's delivering a program or making an offer for a POC, uh, get yourself sorted out in your relationship to equity work and, um, and really get clear on how it sits in your mind. Um, and that this isn't a tokenizing thing. This isn't a, your lesson because it's, I mean, they're bringing a lot of other things that your other candidates aren't, don't bring. Right. So if we value lived experience um, and we value folks who have shared identities with our clients or students, then it's not like they're less than they're just they have different experiences. So I guess that's how I would answer that one right now. Hopefully that's useful. Um, let me keep looking here. Thanks for putting your questions in. Let's see. And we have maybe only like one or two more minutes. Um, OK. I don't know how, um, how do we navigate immigration status? I don't know. Probably have to talk to an immigration lawyer about that. That's a really big one. That's way more complicated than I know. My colleague Kiana is an HR consultant, so she could maybe speak to that, but that's changing so quick and so fast that um, you probably need to, I'd encourage you to ask the lawyer about that. So I don't want to give bad information about that, Maggie, but thanks for asking it. Um, Okay, as we try to tap into new organizations as a recruitment tool for staff, any suggestions on where to start? Tips that have helped you get into the door to start building relationships? Uh, yeah, so this starts with um, me, Fleur Larson, building a relationship with a, another human. And um, who do I not have connections or relationships to? And um, again, if you're, if you're in a place that's a smaller community, there's pros and cons. Like here in Seattle, there's like a billion events I could go to to support an organization. Um, ways I do that, I go to POC-led um, events or fundraisers explicitly just so I can a move money like I donate to the, those organizations because we know when we move money then we're moving resources um, and then you know networking if if I'm awkward it's gonna be awkward this has to be about me actually just wanting to connect with another human so this is really about relationship building authentically and so um, and, and not in a tokenizing way. So again, I'd say that this is your personal, your op personal opportunity to make a connection with a human as authentically as possible. Um, and you said, are, are there any tips that have helped you get in the door to start building relationships? Support, supporting people is always a great way. So whether it's going to events or, um, you know, subscribing to people's newsletters and actually engaging, just engaging with people, um, is I think it's really a useful way before you are going to make an ask. So build a relationship before you are like, hey, we need some people. Will you spread our job posting? So really building a relationship um, and supporting folks before you're going to make an ask of them. Um, yeah. So someone asked about explicit language around equity, but you can't. Um, yeah, you don't. You can't use um, discriminatory language in the hiring process. You can say women and people of color strongly encouraged to apply. You can say that. Um, correct. You can't say that they are preferred, uh, but you can say we strongly encourage women and um, people of color to apply. Uh, if you use language like folks historically marginalized. Um, I, word choice really does signal to me 
where people are at in their own journey around this stuff. Um, so if you use terms like racial justice, we value racial justice, we value racial equity, we prioritize living it, um, or stri we are striving to, um, as opposed to, um, I think the term cultural competency has gotten like a bad rap because it's so watered down. I think it is really what we're talking about is navigating different cultures. Um, but sometimes that's been at arm's length and it's um, like cultural competency trainings are meant to just keep folks with privilege comfortable, but give them some information. So I'm just speaking from my own experience of being a participant in some of those trainings. You maybe have had a different experience, um, but be really thoughtful about your word choice. And because um, sometimes your word choice would signal to me your relationship to doing this work. Uh, and I would encourage people to be bold. Be bold so that you're a little bit nervous. Um, clearly staying within the law. So there's a, there's a, a distinction there. Um, okay. Yeah, so great. Oh, I'm so glad people, someone said people of the global majority. Yeah, people of color versus people of the global majority. So um, which term to use? I was just talking about terms. Um, I mean, I think what's great is to take cues from folks who are of that identity. So if, um, I mean, people I'm around here in Seattle, they say that use the term people of color. So I'm going to use, I'll say that. Uh, terms are changing fast and we're learning things and it's not the same. So, you know, I get clients who are like, well, especially if they're I'm working with some principals um, and they're all white and their students are mostly white. And one was like, oh, I, I never know what to say. It's a landmine. It's like, okay, it's not that, but um, it, it is changing. And so I think being, um, I mean, I'm always learning. I'm going to trainings all the time so I can be in a constant state of like getting up to date. So um, the question was about, should you say people of color or people of the global majority? Um, I would just go with what your community is saying or what people of color in your organization, what they're self-identifying as. Okay, any last burning questions that I haven't answered that are, I'm gonna look through them to see which ones seem really applicable. Um, and then I'll change the slide to, oh, here's a bunch of resources. Again, you'll get this. And then there's so many, so many. Um, the implicit bias test is really good. Um, Verna Myers, Getting Over Bias, that's really great. Um, and then here's my contact info. So I'll leave that up here because um, I know some people asked for it. Feel free to send me job postings. And then um, let's see. Oh, we're, it's after one o'clock, so I know people might have to go. So um, just to close, I'd love to hear what's, what's one thing that you are motivated or excited to do moving forward? One actionable thing that um, you're gonna take away and um, do moving forward for the close. Laura, while folks are writing that down, there are two open questions here that, that mm -hmm. I can see. One, asking how a mid-level staff person oh, okay, can help uh, make a change in hiring practices and make a difference in the organization's racial equity, even if they're not in charge. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I mean, that's such a tricky one if you don't have positional um, power. So one thing is I would ask, ask for um, things for yourself. So as a person who's going to get a performance eval, I would, I would request that you be evaluated around um, values of equity or racial justice. Uh, bring it up. Uh, kind of walking your talk of what you would like to see happen. That's one thing um, when I didn't have hiring authority or positional authority, and I embody what I want to see other people doing. Um, and then raising the question. So sometimes, you know, people, the list of why we can't do things is often really long. And so being in the solution. Um, and so I would offer and, and encourage you to ask people for the things you want to see happening. And when you're met with lots of no's, um, this is our ch your chance to like really like dig deep and be like, how do I keep going without, you know, be staying in a conversation with people. So what is possible? Um, that's one thing I would encourage you to do if you are a mid-level person who doesn't have hiring power. Um, how can you be an advocate for somebody else? Speaking it, saying something risky that um, uh, is a way to really be an active ally. Um, great, thanks for sharing some of your, um, what you're taking away. Great language on your website and hiring materials. Um, incorporating values of um, equity in your performance evals.
hold HR accountable, bring them in, bring them in. It's, it's such a place that could be like revolutionary. I'm so clear about this and so excited about it. Um, yeah, suggest that we change our training program to provide more on-site training. Great, great, good. So I know we're over time, um, and I just wanted to, um, if you need to go, um, thank you for being here with me. I'm happy to stay on and answer a few more questions for another five minutes if folks have them. Um, but here's the contact info if you want to learn more, and the slide deck will be available to you as well, and there's tons and tons of resources in there. So it's great to be with you all, um, and I'm happy to stay here if you have a few more questions. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Floor, for this presentation. This was jam packed with usable content, my favorite kind of workshop. Uh, so I'm very much appreciative of that. And I know it sounds like a lot of people are excited to leave this and immediately start trying some new ideas and having some new conversations. Uh, uh, Eliza, the, yes, the slides will be uh, included in that email that we send you after this. Uh, as well as the recording. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, once again, thank you very much for being here, Floor, and look forward to uh, working with you again in the future, hopefully, hopefully seeing you at a conference sometime. Great, thanks, Dan. Thanks everyone, great to be with you.